That was lovely singing, <clears throat> a favourite hymn of one, of one of my grandfathers, and it's a version I like myself. I'd just like to say before I start that uh, I'm, uh, I did my research from an ESV Bible, and the Angus was uh, speaking from the NIV, so there might be some differences, but it's all much and such the same. I'd like to take you back to a few years ago when Annie and I and my mum and dad uh, were on a cruise. We went on a two-week cruise around the Mediterranean Sea. And if you've never been on a cruise before, I strongly recommend it. There is loads of different food to try out. There's the unlimited ice cream to get from the parlour. There is um, three or four swimming pools to, uh, to in enjoy. But if uh, just working on your tan and lazing on the deck bed is, is more your thing, then there's ample room to do so. You also get to visit half, half a dozen different destinations in one holiday. However, if there is one downside to cruising, it's that you must always travel by sea. On this particular holiday, we had the most amazing weather. Um, the first 12 days were just so uh, unbelievable. In Rome, we had like 40 degrees. It was unbelievable. However, the last two days, not so much. On the 12th day, we visited Gibraltar. And on our final stop, we, uh, we went to Gibraltar on our final stop. And before we headed back to Southampton, um, we had to go past the Cape Trafalgar, head north along the Portuguese coast, and enter the Bay of Biscay. For those who are unaware, the Bay of Biscay is notorious for bad weather. And those two days truly were unbelievable. Now, I must also add that our cabin was right at the very front of the ship. You couldn't get any further than our cabin. I can remember seeing the waves crash over the bow and crash right into our window. That's how far to the front we were. I have two abiding memories of that night. Firstly, whilst lying in bed, and uh, I can remember the ship would go up on the crest of a wave, and just before it crashed back down again, you, you felt as if you're floating for a second, and then it would happen again, and again, and again, over and over. It was truly quite amazing sensation. Now, for some reason, I don't get seasick. I've been in the fortunate position of being on a few cruises now, not forgetting my thrilling afternoons on the paddle steamer Waverley with my dad. But for some reason, seasickness just doesn't affect me. Annie, on the other hand, not so lucky. Whilst enjoying my bouts of feeling like Superman, I can remember seeing Annie leap out of bed. She was staggering towards the toilet, trying to go along the walls. She was taking one step forward, two back. The ship was going up and down. And then I can just remember... Now, another thing you have to realise is on a cruise, the toilet, for some reason, is on a ledge. There's about a wee foot or so, and you have to step into the toilet. And all I can remember is seeing Annie with both hands on, on the door frame like this, trying her best to get over this ledge. Eventually, she f just about fell in and got on with being sick. But those, that is an example of when Annie, myself, mum and dad were caught up in the middle of a storm. The storms we face in life, however, are not only what we face out in the open sea. Most often, we as Christians face storms in our personal lives, in our family, in our friendships and relationships, and in the workplace. Maybe a current storm in your life is seeing your own health deteriorate. Are you in constant physical pain? Are you worried about what the next doctor's appointment might bring? Are you troubled by the poor health of a loved one who is struggling physically or maybe mentally? Have you had or are having problems in your marriage or relationship? Have you got a hopeless situation at work which, where you're continually under scrutiny from the boss? It doesn't matter how hard you persevere, how hard you work, it is never enough. Are you worried at what the next bill is going to be and how it's going to be paid? Are you lacking motivation in your personal life or maybe in your spiritual walk with God? 
These are the storms and the problems that we as Christians face in life on a daily basis. As Charles Spurgeon once said, the path of the Christian is not always bright with sunshine. He has his seasons of darkness and of storm. Therefore, what is the answer to these problems? Where do you put your faith and trust? Where do you, where does your hope lie? By looking at this passage, I hope I can lead you to answering these questions. Four weeks ago, when I, it was confirmed that I had been appointed as a ministry apprentice, I met with Angus and he asked if I had any preaching lined up, to which I replied, yeah, the Salvation Army have invited me back. And Angus then said, so what, what do you fancy preaching on? And I just said, well, I really feel God's leading me to preach on Hebrews 6. Angus' response to this was, Hebrews 6? Angus wasn't shy in letting me know that Hebrews 6 is in fact very, a very difficult passage to preach, both theologically and doctrinally. And while studying for tonight, it became clear very quickly just how hard Hebrews 6 really is. Many ministers have had to preach uh, two or three separate sermons on Hebrews 6 due to the complexity of the text. As the preacher Lee John Duncan once stated, Hebrews 6 is a fearful passage and it makes the heart tremble fearful or not, we must not go around it, we must not go over it, but we must travel through it together. Up to this point, up to this point, the background context to the book of Hebrews is as follows. The author of the letter has been addressing a group of people who have left a Jewish background and are now part of a Christian community who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. However, there has been increasing difficulties, including persecution, and many of these people are now abandoning Christ to go back to their former beliefs. Let us therefore look at this passage of Hebrews 6, 1 to 12, and the most challenging language for us as Christians to get our head around is in verses 4 to 7, and that is where I'd like us to focus our attention so let me read verses 4 to 7. For it is impossible in the case of those who have, been, who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God, to their own harm and holding him to up to contempt. Well, that is challenging indeed. And it helps us to understand how one's heart may tremble. Let us therefore partic take particular notice to the following difficult phrases and what they actually mean. In verse 4, those who have once been enlightened gives an insight and understanding to someone who is able to give a good summary of the Christian faith. Also in verse 4, the words, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, helps to describe someone who has experienced the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 5, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, is referring to someone's genuine experience of the revelation of Scripture. Then we have the whole of verse 6, which is formidable in itself, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. So what does this all mean? Is the writer of Hebrews actually trying to tell us that we could lose our salvation? No. No, he is not. Despite the extremity of the language being used, what is being described here is not a falling away from faith, but rather a falling away from the community of the faithful. For example, the person that is being described in verses 4 to 7 has been involved in the community of faith for some time, maybe even their whole life. 
they have experienced a number of blessings, such as understanding the Scriptures, and may have, been ex- may have even experienced the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. They, have, they, they may have witnessed the power of the Gospel breaking out in signs and wonders. However, whilst having those experiences, this person has not been re- made right by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This person has not received inward transformation. They have not been made new by the Holy Spirit. What is being described here is precisely the situation depicted by Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If this still appears to be confusing, let us look to the story of Judas Iscariot. Judas was called by Jesus. Judas was blessed with the special privilege of being constantly in his presence, enjoying his friendship, and the witnessing his wonderful works. Judas was also one of the disciples who was sent out to the towns and villages to heal the sick and cast out demons, as it says in Matthew 10. However, Judas allowed Satan to tempt him and betray Jesus for his own lust of money. Judas had never fully accepted Jesus into his heart. He had never been transformed. Although Jesus knew the true state of Judas' heart, the other disciples were totally unaware. So, with this in mind, what is the writer of Hebrews trying to achieve? Is he just trying to scare the Hebrews into submission? What does this passage mean? mean for us here and now? The writer answers these questions in verses 9 to 12. He wants his readers to be aware and understand the real possibility of apostasy. It would be wholly irresponsible for him not to warn us of the dangers of falling away. Therefore, he deliberately uses strong language so that even the most committed and faithful Christian never takes lightly their position before the Lord. Secondly, the writer does not wish to see any of his readers drift away, or even worse, take no notice of the fact that they might be drifting away from God. It is a warning to all professing Christians to persevere and be diligent in your walk with the Lord. Now, now that we have battled past that a difficult but assuring passage, let me turn your attention to the final verses of Hebrews 6 in verses 13 to 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The example of Abraham in verse 13 reminds us of the time in Genesis 22 when Abraham had been tested by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. 
The angel of the Lord, of course, intervened, and then God made a promise to Abraham in verse 16 for his faithfulness. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. God, has, God as a holy being, cannot lie. So when God makes a promise, his word alone should be enough for us to rest on with unshakable confidence. But on this occasion, God also swore an oath. For God to swear on himself, the writer believes that, this, that it is tantamount to saying God's word and only God's word was good enough. That when we fall prey to doubt or unbelief, we must remember that there is nothing greater than God. Therefore, God's promise was reliable. Then in verses 14 to 17, the promise and oath which Abraham received was made so that the heirs of the promise, as it says in verse 17, would know God's nature is enduring. The heirs of Abraham the heirs of Abraham being spoken here are not physical descendants, but spiritual descendants. That is to say, those who have been saved by grace and truly believe in Jesus Christ. In Genesis, God promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit the promised land. However, the promise is truly fulfilled by Abraham's descendants by faith. They possess the heavenly homeland to which Abraham looked forward. This has all happened so that we as Christians would have encouragement and knowledge that God's purpose is to bless us completely. We are to know that it, it is wholly impossible for God to lie, and therein those who take refuge in God have everlasting hope. Therefore, this hope which is set before us is a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, this hope has managed to enter the most holy of places, and it is where Jesus has already gone before us. Before I come to a close, I want to tell you another funny story I have from that holiday a few years ago. The morning we sailed into Cannes, the ship was too large for the port, so we had to berth offshore and get tenders backwards and forwards. This meant the ship's 20-ton anchor came into action. Now, as I've said before, our cabin was right at the very front, and therefore the anchor was right beneath us. At 5 a.m., we were all woken with a sudden crash. Ching, 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 ching. The noise was unbelievable. The room was literally shaking. But I hope this image, I hope this image gives you a picture of just how big, strong, and mighty a ship's anchor really is. A ship's anchor has to offer security to the crew that, to the crew of the ship, that the ship won't just drift away, but it will offer stability. And safety. Likewise, the anchor metaphor used in verse 19 displays a rich image and a powerful portrayal of Christian hope. Whereas a ship's anchor plummets down to the seabed, our anchor of hope is heading up towards heaven. It is resting behind the veil in the most holy of places, and it is where we and it is what we cling to in times of trouble. For the veil has been torn in two thanks to the sacrifice of Jesus our Saviour. By clinging to this anchor, we have access to God. For others, hope is just mere wishing for something you want but can't have. Sometimes the failure of mere wishful thinking leads many to despair. But unlike the hope of the world which goes nowhere and has no anchor, our hope is in Christ who has gone before us into heaven, where it is anchored in God and the oath he has sworn. Our hope goes where we cannot yet go ourselves. It goes into heaven, where Christ sets the anchor of our hope with his own pierced hands. Our hope of salvation is attached by the finished works of Christ to the secure foundation 
of the unchangeable character of God. Jesus has gone as the forerunner on our behalf. He has already laid the way, led the way for us. Jesus came to earth to live and to die for us. And when he returned to heaven, it was for our sake to affix the anchor of our hope, hope both sure and steadfast, so that we can be certain and confident of arriving safe in the harbor of heaven. Can unforeseen circumstances break this great anchor? Can the work of men, the temptations of the devil, or the hostility of the world sever a cord emplaced by God himself? Can your sin break the line of this great anchor? The answer to all of these is a resounding no. For God is greater than them all, and his sworn oath shall overrule every opposition. Therefore, I ask you once again, as I did in the beginning, where does your hope lie in the storms of life? I must ask you, are you trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation? Will you take refuge in him when you next visit the doctor, when you visit a loved one who is ill, when you hit more problems with family, work, or in your marriage? If not, then what is your hope? And how will that hold up on the day of judgment? For believers are saved and are safe. For God's oath-bound promise is secured and made fast by the finished and atoning works of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this passage. We thank you that in times of trials, of tribulations, of troubles, and the storms that we face in life, we have a hope to cling to. We have a hope that is Christ Jesus who you sent to live and to die for us. That our sin was put on that cross. That we would no longer worry but put our faith in Christ. And through that we have a longing for heaven to have everlasting life with you. We thank you Lord for this in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>